just to make sure that we can save this. Um, just to start this night, uh, I would like to offer a little um, music movement with an instrument that I uh, bring from Mexico. Uh, this is called an ocarina. It's a clay instrument that uh, very similar to those that Mesoamerican cultures before the Spaniards arrived uh, into the Americas. Uh, we're using this instrument since centuries before the Spaniards arrived and con today nowadays still people, indigenous people in Mexico continue using these instruments. Claso Camati, and uh, welcome to this uh, artist talk. Uh, usually at Soul Collective, I am uh, mostly introducing presenters, facilitate uh, helping hosting the uh, workshops that other artists do or the talks they present. Uh, but this time, I I am the one doing the talk, and uh, just for this uh, amazing project. Uh, Chicana Chicana Chicanex Mexican that is made of an exhibition and virtual talks and a panel discussion. It's a project to highlight the work of uh, Chicano artists, Chicanex artists, Chicana artists, Mexican artists that have been in one way or another uh, close to Soul Collective family. And today I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my uh, history in in the art world and how I get involved into making art. Let me start a uh, really quick sharing uh, some images that are gonna accompany this uh, presentation. Uh, also, I encourage you to, if you have any questions, uh, you can, uh, you have some questions during the uh, presentation, I encourage you to put it in the chat or wait until uh, after the talk. We're gonna have some time for Q&A, so you could ask your questions directly. So let me start with this. Sharing. Are you able to, uh, to see the presentation? I currently cannot see anyone uh, in the screen, so if anyone can uh, let me know. Uh, yeah, we can see it. We can see it, oh, perfect. About art, yeah. Cool, perfect, so about art. So I believe uh, art is really a very powerful powerful tool that can help us to inspire people uh, to change for better. And art by itself, I believe, is not gonna transform society, but uh, art can inspire people. Uh, it can inspire uh, the people that in the communities that are gonna uh, produce the social movements that are necessary for changing for good. Besides, uh, with a lot of the work that I, uh, I do at Soul Collective, I learned that uh, using art not just for uh, the aesthetics or, uh, uh, or art by itself, but also art that inspire people, art that uh, tell our stories uh, that are that really uh, rich and is made for uh, communities that we uh, don't usually see in the big museums and the big institutions. And uh, besides, uh, I have learned uh, to start using art uh, as uh, uh, art for wellness. I am not a therapist, but uh, I encourage people to do art just as an activity to help the stress express yourself and to tell your own stories. Uh, my artwork is uh, basically an invitation for uh, to promote creativity, imagination, 
I really want to inspire people to see uh, different things, to appreciate different cultures. Sometimes I like to make some social commentary about the things that I see in society. Also, my work is inspired by uh, my culture, my uh, life experience, uh, fantastic creators, uh, pop culture, uh, everyday life, as well as uh, by the artwork of many other artists, uh, current artists and artists from the past. And also uh, with the work I do with different communities at Soul Collective, working with uh, all ages uh, people, uh, it, it also inspires my work. Uh, it can be an elder that can inspire me, it can be uh, an adult or even children and working with children also inspire me to uh, create things and develop activities that uh, are really uh, engaging for them. And Many of the uh, techniques that I enjoy to use are mostly drawing, printmaking, uh, digital art, photography, and sometimes music. So I told you a little bit about what inspires me, my culture, my uh, other artists, everyday life, outdoors, family, friends, uh, community, society. And since I was a child, I was really uh, perhaps when I was a child, I didn't put that much attention or the things that surrounded me, but uh, thank, I'm thankful to my family that they exposed me to our culture and also to arts since I was a child. And that I think influenced a lot uh, or in my development to really pursue a career in the arts. First as a graphic designer and later in the arts. Also uh, having exposure to outdoors activities uh, helped me, me a lot. Uh, even nowadays, I continue uh, enjoying the outdoors and with, in company with good friends, also with my partner Angelica, and sometimes with our uh, pet Mono. So this is something that really uh, inspired me a lot. Besides uh, starting growing my own food, uh, when we start with the pandemic, uh, I started uh, growing uh, our own food uh, in our uh, backyard. Uh, it's not enough yet to fulfill all our uh, food needs, but it was a beginning uh, just to reconnect me with the uh, knowledge from my ancestors and also to reconnect me with the land. Also friends, community members, uh, family, they have always uh, have inspired me. Uh, friends from Mexico, friends that I made late, later here in the United States, all the community members that I have met. And the picture, there is only a few of them because it's, uh, it's uh, so many friends that I have made uh, in Mexico and here, but I don't have photographs of all of them. Later, uh, everyday life and my lab experience, like being in Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico in 99 during the student strike, also was something that uh, changed my view of uh, my life. Um, since that, those times I started working uh, collaboratively with some other friends to create posters to promote the student strike. Later after uh, that time when I moved to the United States, also collaboratively, uh, I created some other artwork, in this case a mural for San Joaquin Delta College. Uh, with a couple of friends from Stockton. Uh, working collaboratively also helped me to uh, produce this uh, artist book that some friends from Sublevarte Colectivo in Mexico uh, created. I collaborated with a couple of pages and some stickers um, and they created this artist book uh, called Sublevarte Colectivo uh, 2012 New York uh, Mexico and this book is in collections in different uh, institutions like uh, San Francisco MoMA uh, the Getty Research Institute as well as in, um, in special collections in libraries in UCLA the Stanford um, and I think UC Riverside too and some other universities um, that just showed me the, uh, the power uh, of the uh, working collaboratively because uh, a lot of times as an individual artist, you, unless you have a lot of resources, uh, including money and connections, 
uh, it's going to be very difficult to reach to different audiences and get opportunities. But working collaboratively uh, opens a lot of doors. Um, besides the work that you can create, is more impactful for your communities. In, in these collaborative works, also have a, the chance to lead some projects to create a mural banners that are later used in different uh, demonstrations. Uh, in the, uh, for example, here in the Capitol in, in Sacramento, <coughs> creating uh, these uh, community projects uh, with collaboration of some uh, community artists like uh, Daniel Paniagua from uh, Stockton, uh, also some other friends from Soul Collective. Uh, Rick Gloria, as well as some uh, so many youth and even children and elders that collaborated painting in some of these projects that we later use it for uh, promote social justice. Uh, then my work uh, is inspired by different things. This is one of my mo most recent projects, uh, a poster that was commissioned to Soul Collective to uh, for the most uh, current campaign of the California Faculty Association. Um, they were able to win what they were fighting for. They got a better uh, contract. Um, and that's uh, something that I really enjoy a lot of creating this work for them and then knowing that uh, what they were fighting for, they win some of those things. Uh, my work is also inspired by uh, growing up as a youth. I remember listening to a lot of uh, punk music and uh, seeing a lot of uh, fan scenes, scenes that uh, are produced usually in black and white because it was the cheapest uh, like 20 uh, years ago. It was very uh, cheaper to make photocopies, black and white photocopies of work to produce the scenes. Nowadays, with advancing technology, uh, it's more affordable to also do full color prints. But that inspired a lot of my work and also listening to punk music, the lyrics that they were talking about inspired a lot of my work uh, that a lot of times do uh, social commentary on different issues. Yeah, and besides my work is, uh, most of this work is black and white because uh, I really enjoy the quality of just the black ink on a white paper because it reminds me a lot of the graphic arts of the pre-making, line of goods, wood goods, uh, 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 lithographs, uh, etchings created by amazing uh, printmakers like Leopoldo Mendes, Elizabeth Caitlet, uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada, and so many others. Also, sometimes I jump from the graphic arts, uh, from the printmaking uh, techniques into more uh, digital art, uh, even creating some codices sometimes, combining printmaking, drawing, uh, collaging. This is a print of a sunflower that was commissioned by the Crocker Museum um, in 2020. And this was a, a nice project because they commissioned several artists from the Sacramento area to create different prints that were distributed to elders that were a, a isolating at home in the Great Place program that was running over there in Sacramento. And besides the food, they got a print from uh, one of the uh, different artists that participated in this project. And so it was really nice to uh, to create this and doing some more graphic art in printmaking, block printings, a combination of painting and digital collaging. That is some of the things that uh, sometimes we start uh, teaching a youth at Soul Collective. Uh, I think next month we are starting a with a youth cohort that we're going to be teaching some of these uh, digital art uh, techniques. I'm inspired uh, by uh, the Zapatista movement in Mexico. I remember I was in high school when uh, the Zapatistas started their, uh, when they appeared, not when they started, but when they were public in 94. And that inspired me a lot.
So some old drawings from uh, my days back in the university. So social commentary in the work. And I, I like to work with the printmaking because it allows, um, it's a process that allows allows you to keep, uh, to produce multiples of the same image and each, each image is considered an, or, an original uh, art piece. And that way uh, those pieces uh, is gonna be cheaper for people to acquire them than a painting because for a painting, uh, you only have one, you can still make reproductions, but it's not the same. Uh, and with the prints, uh, linocules, screen prints, lithographs, etchings, each one of the prints is considered an original piece. Uh, painting is also something that I enjoy a lot and not necessarily all the time uh, the themes that I work on are uh, to empower people, but sometimes it's just making uh, visible what, uh, what I see happening around these paintings I created them uh, during the time that the war in Mexico was raging with the drug cartels and the government um, and at the end of the day it was the regular people uh, paying the price so I decided to create this uh, series of prints I made this series of paintings and uh, most of them were making acrylic paint also I included some drawings and some other uh, mixed media uh, projects and this other is a reference it's a mix of uh, acrylic painting and digital uh, collaging just making reference to that absurd, absurd uh, wall that is the uh, in the border not only here in the border between United States what is now now the United States and Mexico but in so many places around the world uh, where uh, people uh, with power just create uh, divisions uh, with other people just to uh, divide them and then create walls to separate them and it's just so bad that I had to do this commentary on that. Also a lot of times I use these skeletal figures uh, because uh, in the time when I was making that uh, project I was really inspired by the work of printmakers like Jose Guadalupe Posada that used a lot of skeletons in his prints and at the same time thinking like okay what is the essential part what is the uh, the the stroke the human uh, structure that supports the human body um, in this case is the uh, I I put the bones uh, if, I, if I was gonna be more uh, close to reality will be the bones and the muscles but in this case for the series where I was working I for me it was better to use just the structure of the uh, the bones the skeleton. And this series, uh, I created several paintings and still I continue to do some uh, work related to this series, not necessarily to the first part, but uh, with the, say, with the same uh, work that I created. Uh, besides uh, some of the work that I do for myself, I uh, really started been involved in uh, collaborative projects and creating art exposure experiences uh, because I believe that art is really essential. Uh, in Mexico, uh, I really didn't have access to art education in a school, the, in elementary school, the same teacher that we have uh, teaching us every other subject. Uh, once in a while allowed us to do some drawings and some other things to uh, to do in class, but I never really have a, a teaching artist coming into the classroom and and teach me art. Um, and that's why I decided to, okay, yeah, I'm not going into a classroom to teach young people because uh, in a, a lot of the schools, they are cutting arts. Uh, they, that's the first thing that they always cut all the times that they are making budget cuts. 
arts, uh, they uh, try to eliminate them completely. And thankfully, I was able to come to Soul Collective um, and then start uh, working with them, developing uh, uh, art uh, making activities, like pop up um, art making activities where we just arrive to a place, set up tables, art materials, we show them how to use them and then allow them to be as creative as they want to be. Um, the image on the top left, that was from the uh, project that was uh, received a grant from the Crocker Art Museum uh, for the Block by Block project, where in collaboration with Andrew, uh, Andrew Bell uh, from CFG, we put together, uh, he bring the CFG crew to put together a mobile stage for uh, music producers, for open mic, for poets. And I bring uh, the part of the mobile gallery are making a space where I bring some artwork from different artists. Uh, we acquired artwork from a few artists uh, to show in the mobile gallery. And besides, we have the uh, the option for people to come and do some prints and some other uh, art making activities. And if they wanted, they could leave one of their creations with us to include in the mobile gallery. So the next time we set up in a different part of the city, we were going to show their work too. So let me stop sharing this one. And also I want to show you uh, a little video about a uh, the art making process because uh, a lot of times is something that uh, people really uh, enjoy uh, watching the process. You usually only see the final piece, but it's also really interesting how the artists arrive to this uh, other part with the uh, in their art making processes. So let me share this other video. So this is just a, a, an image uh, that I made. It's a combination of a painting, a photograph, and digital collaging and animation. And the process I want to show you is uh, printmaking. In printmaking, uh, something that is really uh, very important for printmakers and other artists is the paper. Paper is uh, really uh, amazing. You can find so many different kinds of paper with different qualities. Some papers are really thin and translucent, while, uh, while some other uh, papers are uh, thick, uh, made with cotton rag, and are really good for printmaking and some other uh, wet mediums like painting, watercolors. And these papers are really uh, something fantastic. If you ask a printmaker, uh, he can start talking about papers for a long time. Uh, one of the techniques that I really enjoy in printmaking is the screen printing. Uh, I showed you at the beginning uh, some uh, images of posters that we created in Mexico in the university during the strike. We use uh, this technique, uh, screen printing. That, uh, this is a technique that uh, allows to produce a lot of prints. Uh, all of the prints are, uh, can have the same quality. And this is a technique that uh, in Sacramento was uh, a technique that uh, many artists from the uh, Royal Chicano Air Force used to uh, produce the posters to uh, inform people about uh, the different events they were having, about uh, their rights, about the uh, Chicano activism. And nowadays uh, they have uh, uh, some of those posters uh, are on display at the Sacramento State Library Gallery. You ever had a chance to stop over there, just check for the posters that they have installed over there. And this is a technique that in many parts of the world, many artists have been used for because it's a cheap technique and people can participate in creating the different works. 
y, y Dustin Rocco era Lord of Equipment, just the, uh, the screen, uh, you don't even need the press that I'm using in the video, just getting the hinges that you can adapt on a, any table, and then put the screen there, and then with the squeegee print and print and print, and that technique is very nice because allows for collaboration of people, so you can have three or more people printing and the process is going to be faster. Even you can have uh, uh, 20 people helping in there and uh, uh, you just uh, divide the task. Okay, now you're going to put the paper in here and somebody's going to take the paper out and somebody else is going to be printing, somebody else is going to be putting the ink in there, uh, someone else is going to be making sure that uh, we put the papers in a right place to dry. So it's a very collaborative uh, process. Uh, with the block printing, uh, it can be collaborative too. Like for example, in big pieces of work, there are some artists that like to teach the, the use of uh, collaborative projects. Um, get a big piece of wood, like four by eight feet, then carve the design, the, the make the design as a collaboration and then carve it uh, all together. Um, that uh, has been happening with some artists that I have a friend, uh, Masat, he, ha he has been doing that uh, uh, with some uh, different community organizations uh, in some classes that he also taught together with Killjoy um, in a California State University a few years ago. Also, there are some other artists from, like Tarim Padi from Indonesia, that they also create these uh, big uh, collaborative projects. Uh, in this case, it's just uh, an old video from my days in, in the school at Sac State, uh, just showing you the process of printing these line of cuts. So the idea is first you carve your design on a piece of linoleum, on a piece of wood, and then uh, you ink your design, uh, then you move the design to uh, a press, put the paper you're going to print on top of that, run it through the press, and then you have your first print. And then uh, the process repeats itself. You're going to ink again the plate, uh, get some more paper, run it through the press, and you just do that over and over and over again until you complete the edition that you want to create. Um, Editions can be any number. Uh, I don't know. For I always like to do at least six prints uh, to call uh, to call it an edition. Some other people may only print uh, three or four, and that's okay too. And other times um, I like to print a lot, like uh, more than thirty prints of the same design. Also, depending on the material that you choose. You choose linoleum to make your prints. Uh, you can make a, a big run, a big addition, uh, 30 or more prints. But after, I don't know, around 100 prints, your linoleum is going to start to deteriorate. You can also print by hand, and uh, that will uh, keep the linoleum in better condition. But you want to print more than 100 prints, maybe I recommend you use uh, wood and then it will be a woodcut. Other technique in block printing is the uh, stamping. Um, for this one is uh, very easy, you just get uh, the few uh, lin uh, lino blocks or rubber blocks and then you uh, carve it just like uh, the same way that you carve uh, the linoleum and then you, you can just print uh, by using the inking pads instead of having the roller and inking by hand, you just get some inking pads and you can find them in different colors and then print. And this uh, last technique is really a, a good option if you are working with children and instead of using the, uh, the more messy uh, inking process of the roller, you just uh, have the inking pads and sometimes you can, uh, instead of using the inking, inking pads, you can use, use like tempera paint, especially with children. And 
Uh, it doesn't matter if they get their hands uh, with the paint because tempera is uh, non-toxic. And um, this is just uh, a quick and uh, few examples of so some of the work I like to do. I also get to enjoy doing uh, music and I have a collection of indigenous instruments like the one I uh, shared with you at the beginning. And in Mexico, I used to play with some friends. Uh, my, uh, they started playing in Mexico several uh, years ago, around 97, 98. They were called uh, Shukotl. Um, there were friends from the School of Arts that uh, they were taking a wood sculpture class, but one of their projects was to, they wanted to recreate the indigenous instruments like drums, the huehuet, or the teponastles. So they started doing this for their class. Later, later they decided to get together and, and make music. As, uh, with this project of Shukotl, but before that project, they were taking, they were, uh, they were already having uh, some pass in music, coming from bands uh, that were uh, playing uh, death metal, metal, uh, hard rock, and then jumping into the indigenous instruments. So that eventually evolved into a different project called Tlokenawake, where they were using the indigenous instruments, then mixing it with the electric guitar electric bass and saxophone and later they invite me to join and I bring in the, a sampler just having different uh, samples of, of different sounds that I was incorporating in the music and also helping a little bit with with some of the drums and wind instruments and they are still doing some uh, uh, music as, as clock and awake and uh, maybe you can find them uh, online find some other music. I recommend you that. And I guess uh, something else that I uh, enjoy with, uh, with the art making is uh, just the process of getting together with some other people, even friends, and, and then just uh, having some art supplies uh, at hand and start uh, creating anything. Is uh, there is no uh, need to develop uh, something really difficult. It's just sitting with some friends, uh, start creating anything that you can imagine. And so, uh, also I want to show you a little uh, example of uh, one of these uh, projects that you can do at home. Even. Uh, when you are uh, by yourself or, or even with some other family members. So this, this is an easy exercise and let me show you the This is an exercise uh, that you're going to start with a piece of paper. Um, it doesn't need to be a really nice piece of paper. It can be just a simple copy paper or, a, or a, any kind of paper that you have at hand, a, a pencil or a pen or even crayons. But at the beginning, I like to recommend you see the pencil because at the beginning, you are going to start scribbling on your piece of paper just to mark all around. So for this project is, uh, I like to use this when I am uh, really uh, feeling that I don't have any idea that is coming into my mind right in the moment. So just uh, to break with this uh, uh, blockade, I like to just start scribbling on the piece of paper. Uh, let me see, you can maybe see a little bit of the, So first you start creating all your lines all around. Uh, you put your pencil on top of the paper, start creating marks all around. You don't leave the pencil until you feel that you have 
uh, fill it, your piece of paper with enough uh, marks. Then you leave your pencil. And then in the lines you created, you start looking for a design, a pattern, anything in there. And you start following some of those lines and start uh, creating, finding these, uh, I call them fantastic creatures inside the piece of paper. It can be something that uh, look cartoonish. You can also try to find things that are look more realistic, but also it can be just abstract design. Uh, you don't have to create something that is a very figurative design. It can be just anything abstract, and if you are going to create something abstract, you just uh, get different uh, colored pencils or crayons that are cheaper. And then you should start filling different areas uh, using the as a guide the lines that you first scribble in the, your design. This is a really nice activity to break a uh, blockade when you have the what we call the white paper syndrome. When we don't know what, uh, ha what is happening with us, but we don't come up with any idea. It's something similar to when uh, people is uh, doing a, a creative writing. Sometimes you get to a point, uh, you start trying to write anything, but you don't have any idea what to write about. Then you can start uh, brainstorming just anything that comes to your mind. Even if the words that come in mind don't really have uh, any sense of connection between one another, just start uh, recording those uh, words in a piece of paper and that is going to help you to break away from that blockade that you are facing. Um, with the art, is something similar. Just start uh, with an exercise like this one, scribbling around. Uh, other times you can just start uh, sketching anything. Uh, just anything that comes into your mind. Sometimes uh, you can use something as a model, something that you're looking in front of you, a, an object. Uh, a flower, a plant, like those could be your models to start uh, drawing. Well, it, it doesn't have to be uh, always that. You can just sometimes just draw whatever you want in there. Even sometimes with painting, uh, you feel like, okay, I don't have really a, a theme. I don't really want to do something very uh, figurative. So just start splatting paint all around your uh, your piece of paper or canvas uh, kind of uh, reminds a uh, reminiscent of the action painting that artists like Jackson Pollock was doing back in the, I don't remember, 60s, around 60s, 70s, I think, uh, or even before. But uh, yeah, something that's so very fun for me studying art here in the United States was like, yeah, we are in the United States. So the, the artists that everyone references are American artists like Jackson Pollock. But well, something very curious about Jackson Pollock is that he took a, a, a work, he took workshops with uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros, the Mexican muralist. He came to the United States. I was doing a series of uh, workshops uh, teaching uh, their art techniques to different artists. And one of the artists that attended those workshops were, was Jackson Pollock. And yeah, that um, that's a, a, I think I'm gonna stop right now. Uh, I can tell you some other more stories, but uh, just to have enough time for Q&A, uh, thank you for being with me. In, um, just let me know if you have any question, uh, start uh, putting it in the chat, or uh, you're also free to mute yourself and ask the question. It can be anything about, uh, I see Nancy. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Uh, thank you for joining. No, thank you for, sorry, sorry about this. But you really inspire me a lot because Besides the beautiful work, the aesthetic, the message, you know, the, the, the awareness to the community about your work, it's not just, but also the way you document it. A lot of the artists, we don't really do that. So um, I don't know if you can 
speak a little about that how do you like do you do it yourself somebody help you um and this is really important especially when we want to promote work at the museums or exhibitions this is an excellent example for us as an artist to really do i don't know if you can speak a little about that mm -hmm. sure um uh, yeah my uh, work as a an artist uh, I sometimes I like to think like I started becoming an artist when I was a children, but then the first uh, artworks that I created were not exactly something that my grandparents and uh, parents enjoyed when I was painting with the crayons on the walls. So moving forward, when I was in high school, I started taking a after school class in photography. That was my first uh, conscious approach to art because that's the first time I, uh, besides attending as a child to different museums and some art events, uh, when I was in high school, uh, starting exploring what I wanted to do in my life, I took that photography class that it started helping me to develop uh, skills that in that time were necessary to do black and white photography in the lab when we were still using the film then the taking the photographs developing the film and then in the dark lab uh, uh, transferring the images from the film into paper developing that that started uh, started to develop this technique to be very precise in the steps to follow because uh, in photography you have to be very precise in the uh, in the dark room to accomplish uh, different things that you want you can manipulate some things to uh, experiment with other uh, possibilities but it's something that is very preci precise I, I will compare it more or less with uh, uh, with the uh, chefs that make pastries that they are very precise of what the recipes they use uh, the same with photography and eventually with printmaking once I went to university I was studying graphic design and at the beginning it was very uh, a square view, I will say a square view of, okay, things have to be this way. These are the, the guidelines that you have to follow to create uh, this uh, kind of works. And that helped me once I moved into the United States and jumping into art school, I started to uh, do printmaking and that uh, very precise approach and detailed approach to things helped me to with the printmaking because it's a process that uh, requires a lot of attention to detail very tedious process uh, takes time it helped me a lot but it gave me some trouble when i started painting because i wa i had this uh, very mechanical hand that learning how to do technical drawing that I also took technical drawing classes in middle school in Mexico so my designs and drawing one were really very precise using rulers and uh, so breaking up from that and, and and jumping into painting that is more free uh, you still have to control the brush but everything is more free uh, was challenging for me then I went to uh, art school, graduated art school. Uh, also, the, the time that I went into art school uh, was after uh, I dropped out of uh, graphic design school in Mexico. I came here, I was working for several years. Later, I decided to go back to school. And as an adult returning to school, uh, seeing the cost of uh, going into classes, I was uh, very focused. Now I have to learn everything and finish as soon as possible. It helped me to uh, keep going, even though a lot of times I didn't feel that what I was trying to do was really well received with uh, with uh, with other students that uh, didn't relate to the experience. So uh, this Mexican coming from uh, Mexico and telling us about other things that are happening somewhere over there in Mexico, uh, that helped a lot. Um, and also the friends that I made in school uh, also migrants uh, we connected with each other and we were working with uh, similar uh, similar teams but in a, uh, we were approaching to those things in a different way but 
our common experience uh, was that, that got us together. Later, uh, collaborative projects with my friends from Mexico. Uh, we did a, a couple of collaborative projects and exhibition in New York and artist talks, and then the artist book that I show you images in the beginning that they, I just make the two pages that I created, send the pages to them in Mexico, and they, over there, they put the books together. Um, and that later, uh, jumping into Soul Collective, I'm starting helping managing the gallery uh, starting giving me uh, skills and organizing the skills that uh, a lot of uh, artists uh, will lack. But besides that, all that work is so collective. <clears throat> also, uh, when I was a student, I was involved with Mecha. Uh, over there, I was from the publicist to a uh, chair in uh, different years. So that also gave me a lot of experience in organizing things and being more uh, detailed in, in, in managing the different projects that I was working on. Uh, I still learn in that process. And thankful, uh, thankfully, it's all collected. Many mentors over there help us with uh, these uh, managing skills. Uh, Estela Sanchez, one of them, uh, Eric Vega, and so many other mentors that have helped us uh, in this process of learning uh, uh, how to produce events, art, culture, uh, activities related events, and, and then how to transfer those skills that you learn in organizing events, how to transfer those into your career as an artist. Uh, there are many ways that you can transfer those. Uh, a lot of times, uh, so I will say I would recommend that uh, don't try to do everything by yourself as an artist. If you get to uh, have some extra funds, uh, hire someone else to help you with the with that process because uh, you cannot be creating the artwork, then being your own uh, social media expert and advertising your designs, then being your representative to sell your artwork and managing the sales and all that. Uh, if your career is evolving uh, you had a chance get someone to help you with that and and yeah those are some are some of the skills that have helping me into uh, uh, managing art projects uh, collaborating with other people uh, by myself I don't think I will have reached the point that I have reached right now you I you I have focused on working just on my uh, myself both collaboratively, collaboratively with other friends, uh, with different collectives, different organizations and groups of artists. That's how helping me to to push the work uh, uh, for better. And a lot of times, uh, as an arts administrator, you are doing a lot of work that uh, seems very tedious that you may see that it doesn't really benefit in your career as an artist, but is benefit that work is benefiting other artists and that eventually is also benefiting yourself as an artist because if all other artists are benefiting from the things that you are doing, uh, it helps everyone. It's like a push all of us up. Uh, I think I say hello. I, I hopefully answer your uh, your question. Um, anyone else has another question? I just want to say thank you for sharing with us. And good luck in your project. Oh, yes, thank, thank you for you. being here. I see Monica. Uh, yes, uh, Monica, uh, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is the first time I am uh, uh, on the Zoom to listen to one of the artists yeah, from the uh, Soul Collective. And I just wanted to ask if, one, you've been able to drive up and down uh, the Delta because some of the artwork that I like in the Sacramento region uh, are from artists that have painted uh, scenes of the Delta. I find the Delta is so calming. And then recently I went to an art show and there was a, a, a laborer 
with these beautiful vivid green colors, you know, from the fields and things in the background. And, you know, when I'm home, I need to have calming uh, pictures or scenes around me, whether it's the window, looking out at the trees or, or the waters. And uh, it's, it's so beautiful out there. And then bringing that labor aspect into it also would be nice and that's something i could really you know enjoy having in my home but i love um i love that you you know your story that you showed us how uh your work process is and yes with my family i either try to get them out in nature you know or play puzzles read go to plays. I'm an actress in Sacramento myself and, you know, try to uh, play games and things with the kids and, and uh, encourage art. So uh, I appreciate every, everything that you've done and that you continue to do. And I want to commend you on such beautiful English that you speak as well. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you have the chance to uh, uh, be around the Delta. Uh, actually, right now I move it back to the Central Valley, uh, and yeah, I used to when I arrived here if, to the United States first. I was uh, living in Stockton. Then I currently went a little uh, uh, further south to Modesto, but still uh, commuting to uh, Soul Collective to do work there, and. Yes, yeah, just the experience of, of the Delta uh, when I was uh, spending uh, most of my time in, in Stockton, just going to the Delta and seeing the fields. Uh, also, uh, my family uh, used to work in the fields. Uh, I myself worked in the, I, I call it the easiest job in, in, in farm working was picking, picking up cherries. That's, uh, the difficult part is just going up in the, in, on the stairs, but it's not as difficult as picking up the oranges or apples or, or pears. And that uh, inspired me a lot, like uh, seeing uh, how, uh, how amazing is the Central Valley that we have uh, uh, the access to the uh, Delta, we have access to to other rivers in the region, Stanislaus, uh, we have the uh, later, uh, later more, we're going more north, we have access to the Sacramento River, the American River, that have made this uh, region really rich in, in agricultural region. This is a uh, prime land uh, to produce food, uh, yet a uh, I would say colonized land, uh, the original indigenous uh, inhabitants, most of them were uh, 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 were uh, killed uh, just to take over their lands and the ones that are still, uh, their descendants that are still around, some of them are still fighting to just keep uh, small pieces of land uh, in their uh, hands. Um, but yeah, it's uh, really amazing though, all the Delta, uh, the Sacramento, all bodies of water uh, have always inspired me. I am not necessarily a person that uh, likes to get into the water because I grew up in Mexico City, um, once in a while swimming in a pool, but uh, I am not really so, someone that has to, uh, know how to swim really well, except in a pool <laughs> and for a little bit. But yeah, the water, the movement in water is always inspiring and it's a subject that many artists have uh, visited uh, throughout history. From those uh, marks in the caves by the early humans to nowadays digital artists like recreating water in, in, with video in galleries. Um, does anyone else has a question? If not, um, uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Luis. We really appreciate everything that you do, and your work is inspirational. And um, yeah, thank you for this information and this knowledge that you shared with us today. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. 
Uh, I invite you to continue uh, checking uh, Soul Collective social media for the upcoming talks. Next week on Wednesday, we are going to have a panel uh, with Chico Gonzalez, Maceo Montoya, and Jose Lot. And Tere Romo is going to be moderating that panel. Uh, check our uh, social media to get the link to, to that panel. And then in March 1st, um, uh, we're going to have a, an artist talk by Chico. And March 3rd, an artist talk by uh, Jennifer Andrea Porras. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And uh, have a nice uh, rest of your evening. And make art, uh, enjoy art. Uh, it doesn't matter if you think that you don't have uh, uh, the skills to be an artist, you can still create something. It's just something that you have to give permission to yourself. Uh, you don't have to have a something that you have to fulfill. It just give permission to yourself, no pressure, and enjoy uh, whatever you are doing, uh, drawing, sketching, painting, even translating those creative skills into whatever uh, other area uh, or profession you have. That's always very helpful. And, and if you have children, uh, even if they are not your children, family members, uh, expose them to art, expose them to the outdoors. And that is something, expose them to nature, expose them to uh, uh, four-legged uh, friends like uh, dogs because that is going to help a lot in their development uh, and improve their creativity and thank you very much for being here have a good night